Hello and welcome to this CNBC Africa special. In today's edition of Here for Africa, we will focus on the Africa Summit 2019, which was greatly attended by key leaders and stakeholders in the country's finance sector, public sector and the private sector, as well as the conversations were on transforming Africa into the next global growth engine. In what was said, prevention of climate change is estimated to cost the global economy almost 14 trillion US dollars per year by the year 2100, hence why sustainable finance is now shaping the future of global finance. Africa Summit 2019 was greatly attended by key leaders and stakeholders in the country's finance sector, public sector and the private sector. The conversations were on transforming Africa into the next global growth engine. In what was said, prevention of climate change is estimated to cost the global economy almost 14 trillion US dollars per year by the year 2100. Hence, why sustainable finance is now shaping the future of global finance. I think the fact of the matter is, if you look at nominal terms, Africa contributes only 1%, Sub-Saharan Africa contributes only 1% to the global growth. If you look at purchasing power parity, it contributes 2%. Putting that into context, Asia contributes 63 to 64%. That's the dimension you've got to keep in mind. So that's a huge gap. That's a huge gap. Africa predominantly has been an exporter of commodities. Manufacturing has picked up, but it remains a pretty insignificant contributor to local economies. That's a fact. If you look at sub-Saharan Africa, the overall installed capacity of power, if you take a metric for infrastructure, is around 65, 66,000 megawatts, and of which a quarter is non-functional. So we are talking about sustainable finance. We are talking about Africa. Why do we need to get it right? I think that's a, that's a very important question. Why do we need to get it right in Africa? If you start looking at just the surface, surface area that you need to address from a global perspective, Africa accounts for the US, China, Europe, and India combined. So you're addressing a big part of the world. You're not addressing it in a small city-state from where I come, Singapore. You're addressing it for a large part of the world. You're addressing the issue for a continent which has the future or the prospect to become the breadbasket of the world. Earlier this year, in the city of Barbados, I launched globally the World Investment Report 20, 20, 2019. Now, this has two things that are important in the discussion of uh, where Africa is going. Number one, globally, there is declining return on investment in manufacturing. If you even look at manufacturing enterprises, value is shifting from the actual process of making value to the services sector of manufacturing. So the, the servicization of manufacturing, as it were. That is phenomenal, because it means a global FDI, which has been very reluctant to go into vulnerable economies, is going to be even more hesitant with the declining returns on manufacturing as value added. While this has been happening, something else has been happening. The massive expansion of services sector, even services as a component of manufacture, is a major, major phenomenon. A second thing that's of significance to the development community is that globally, investment in greenfield projects has migrated massively to East Asia. Last year, 149 billion US dollars, equivalent to 40% of global cross-border FDI, was in Eastern Asian economies. This has two components. One, the growing concentration of co 
of uh, savings and investable capital in East Asia, of global value chains, happens outside Africa. And you are not going to grow manufacturing unless you start addressing how far downstream can we go in value addition, value creation, even cross-border investment in Africa. I think unless we can answer that question, our dream of transforming Africa and even converting our population into a dividend remains a political delusion. The continent is currently investing in infrastructure and other respective sectors in line with the country's development plans. Looking on the side of sustainable finance, are the investments being injected in the right places and how can the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement be leveraged? In Africa, the two largest countries signed up to the CFTA on the last day in Niamey. But even worse, in Niamey we agreed that the worst you can do is stand still on tariffs, meaning that after Niamey, no African enterprise should pay higher taxes in moving goods to another African country. The process of integration requires that the language of brand, national brands, is compromised by the notion that while we can, in the short term, lose some jobs, even lose some, lose some market share, in the medium and long term, we have more gain by opening up to our neighbors. Secondly, Africa does not invest in its digital economy. I need African financial services to start looking at how do we cross the border of the unknown and invest in digital startups. As bankers, you look at what is your credit history, what is your capital stock. How do you ask those questions to a tech startup? Their main stock is in their heads, <laughs> and their capital is in their laptop. How do they access credit in the normal way? Abnormal times require that financial markets also start doing abnormal things to finance the next drive of Africa's growth. I think there are different uh, conversations. There are supply-side conversations. Supply-side means on the input side. What can we do to reduce the cost of capital? What can we do to increase the sources of capital? And today there were very interesting uh, dialogue around the various sources of capital. How can we target diaspora funding uh, a lot better? How can we make it cheaper for Africans outside Africa to transfer capital into this country? How can we encourage pension funds to invest in uh, long-term infrastructure? How can we reduce the cost of funding uh, by banks to the real economy? How can we increase uh, access to capital for various sectors, whether it's agriculture or the digital space? I think those are critical discussions. And also discussions around how can we better match the skill set of our youth to the needs of, of the world, because they should be able to have opportunities uh, all over the world. So there are discussions on the on the supply side there are also discussions on the demand side around uh, the value chains how can we participate in more profitable uh, value chains rather than being primary uh, producers how can we better tap the african uh, market so the discussions around the afcta and the need for political will and uh, private sector participation to make the fcta uh, more more viable the african continent needs 2.5 b trillion US dollars to be able to implement the Paris Climate Change Agreement, that is to put actions in place that can be able to ensure that Africa's climate resilience is enhanced. But at the same time, Africa also needs 1.2 trillion each and every year to implement the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So the bigger question then becomes, with all these astronomical amounts of money, where will Africa get this, given that Africa, when it comes to its main source of revenue, which is tax collection, it's only collecting about 500 billion each and every year. That's roughly just about 12% of the amount that they collect. When it comes to uh, ODA, the Overseas Development Assistance, Africa can only benefit up to about 40 billion. So when you juxtapose this within the needed finance, it becomes quite very, very troubling to see where Africa will transform and at the same time ensure that they leave no one behind. There has been fear on the impact that the fluctuating oil prices has on the global economy and if sub-Saharan Africa will be dramatically affected. During the Africa Summit, an analysis was shared on this. Oil prices, here in Kenya, that is always a big driver of potential risks.
We are in something of a sweet spot right now. We see the Goldilocks effect on oil prices. If you look at our oil price forecasts, we're looking at a situation which isn't too hot, nor is it too cold. We see oil prices being supported and sustained at a relatively high level compared to what we'd seen certainly in 2015, 2016, ultimately thinking that there are still upside pressures. Now, because markets are so fixated with the day-to-day -day headlines at this point, everyone is concerned about the escalation in the global trade war. Everyone is concerned that every time there's an adverse headline, what we tend to see is risk aversion taking hold. And because of positioning in the oil market, oil prices are also impacted. But if we were to step away from this, there is a medium to long-term story that is more constructive for oil prices. First of all, as much as there has been increased supply from the US and shale production is still something to contend with, if we look at the amount of supply that has been taken out from the likes of Venezuela and Iran, actually that pretty much balances a lot of the rise in US production. Recently, there was a change to the Saudi energy minister. Many are speculating that this resolves the willingness on the part of the Saudi government to try to ensure that oil prices are supported at a level that will keep their budget calculations relatively comfortable. What we think is the ultimate driver of oil prices is that in recent years, given that we had seen this price weakness, there just hadn't been enough supply in conventional oil to be able to make up for future demand. On the conversation, one of the most touched on concerns was the rising debt portfolio here on the continent. Here is more on understanding the impact and the alternative source of funding that needs to be unlocked. There's a need to carry on having continued investment in infrastructure, etc. But it's equally important to understand what needs to be done to sustainably grow the private sector, both from uh, micro SMEs uh, to large companies, so that then you can sustain the you can sustain the growth uh, and, and sustain the debt in, into the long term. Uh, ten years ago, uh, the, the, the private debt market uh, in the capital markets were very were very robust. And, um, and, and many companies were tapping into the, into, into the markets for, for long-term capital. However, unfortunately, because of some of the recent corporate failures we've had, investors have lost their money in the corporate debt, debt market. And therefore, the appetite for corporate debt is no longer there. I think there's need to see what you can do to, to revive the corporate debt market again and to see whether we can use it to tap uh, long-term long -term capital. Uh, both from retail and uh, institutional investors to, to channel it to some of these projects. There's a growing economy. We need to be able to project our resources. We need to be able to put in our resources in the correct place. And we also need to be able to work within our resources. And if we are able, we have to borrow for us to sustain our expenses, then we have to be able to borrow within as limits that we can be able to reap. First, we must applaud our governments. The fact is they are trying to put in place infrastructure in place. But in my view, we need to support more the health sector and the education sector because these are the backbone. We need to have people who are healthy and we, have to need, we need to have skills. So we need to build the skill labor in the education sector. That brings us to the end of this edition of Here for Africa, where the conversation was directed towards why it is important for sustainable finance to shape the future of global finance, as well as what it takes for Africa to be the next global growth engine. I am Naringwa Fiona Muthoni. Thank you for watching.